When people go through trials, they often lose hope for their future. Well, today on Daily Renewal, I'm going to show you how to navigate through trials. Well, today I want to start off by asking you a question. How are you doing, my friend? This was a question that was posed to a group of us that got together for prayer this week by another church leader, and, and he opened this up because he said, you know, I just want to be open and say, you know, my wife and I, we're having a really hard time, and we could use prayer. And as I began to think about it, he said, I wanted just to, just to ask you guys, how are you doing? Is there anything we can pray for you about? And, uh, and as, he, as he, we went through this, one by one, each and every person that was there began to unfold their story about, about how rough a time they're going through. And, uh, you know, everybody seemed to have a prayer request. And then as it came around the circle and came to me, I have to admit, it was a little awkward for me. And I said to, to my friends, I said, I'm going to be real honest. I don't have any real pressing needs. Things are actually going fairly well. Now, I say that to say this, uh, when I say fairly well, there's always things that we can use prayer for. And, uh, but the, the reason why I, this kind of caught me off guard is, and I said this to them, I said, you know, I'll be honest with you, right now, I don't have anything. Uh, you know, we've all got things. But for me, if you would ask me this a year ago, two years ago, you know, the past few years have been some of the toughest trials that, that my wife and I have ever gone through in our lives. Trials in ministry, trials with health, uh, trials with different family members, whether it be with health, you know, finances. There's been numerous trials we've gone through over the past few years. But as I looked at the situation currently, I, I was reminded that so many of these trials that were, as I mentioned, excruciatingly painful at the time, we have come through to the point where God has uh, truly delivered us from many things. And the thing about, you know, when it comes to trials, I mean, you, if you're anything like me, which I guarantee that, you know, these things happen to you, it's not usually just one trial. Often it's, it feels like there's multiple things coming at you. And just when you think you can't go any further, something else happens. You know, that's often the way it happens with trials. But, you know, I, as I uh, was at this meeting, I just found that I was at this point that uh, I had gotten through a lot of these trials and very thankful for it. But it's with that today that I want to share some of the things that, that uh, with you that helped me get through those trials to the point where now I'm looking back at, at those trials and seeing, uh, seeing God's power to deliver. Well, I'm Pastor Lyle and welcome to Daily Renewal. If this is your first time tuning in with us, I just want to uh, encourage you to become a subscriber to our channel. If you're getting benefit from this content, which I hope you are, uh, I hope that you will share this video with anybody that you think that it will help. Well, this idea of getting through trials, there's many, uh, and I've done videos on this before, but there's a couple things I, I just want to share with you that really came to the forefront when uh, when I looked at how um, how I process through some of these situations that that uh, that we go through, now first of all we have to understand, you know God isn't looking to punish us. You know we do have an adversary who, uh, like a roaring lion, roams about seeking whom he may devour. But make no mistake about it, anything that we go through, God only not only knows about it. But uh, you know, if it's an attack from the devil, God has allowed it to happen. And he wouldn't allow that to happen if he didn't know that you couldn't come through it. The big thing for everybody as we go through trials is learning how to draw close to God, learning how to trust God, to walk by faith to get through these situations. And as I look back on the story that I just told you, uh, one of the glorious uh, things that I have to say about that is I look back at, at all of these things that God has brought us through. What it's done is it, it's, it um, brought a, a more firm foundation to my faith and the faith of my wife, you know, seeing that as we trusted God, God not only could, but did bring us through. There was times, friend, where there's no way we could do anything in our own strength but it was, uh, it was totally relying upon him and, 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 and letting him be God in our life. 
You know, and so if it's one thing I really want to encourage you with is this, is if you stay close to God, things are going to work out. You are going to be strengthened in your faith. This is, this, this is absolutely paramount as you may be going through your current situation. So there's two specific things that I want to talk to you about today. Uh, the first one, we can see an example of this in 1 Samuel uh, 30. And I want to encourage you on your own uh, to take a look at the story in uh, chapters 29 and 30. This is a story where it, it really is a, t a tough circumstance that David's going through. In fact, multiple tough circumstances. Uh, he had not become king of Israel yet. In fact, he had fled Israel in an act ended up living with his enemies uh, uh, you know, up until that point. He acted crazy just so he could go live with them. And uh, he had had this army of people that were rejected. You know, I call it David's reprobate army. People that were rejected by a lot of other nations. They were they trusted in David. And but this this uh, the Philistine army didn't, or that some of the kings or some of the leaders there didn't really trust that David was with them. So he's, they're getting ready to go out to battle and, you know, because some of them didn't trust David, they sent him home. Well, when he went home, they left their wives, wives and children behind. When they're, here they are, they're already rejected, they're going through all these things, David's leading these guys. He comes home and the Amalekites had looted, looted and pillaged and stole all their women and children. Well, if that wasn't bad enough, all of the guys who were following David, they had lost hope with David and were actually looking to kill him. And in, um, in verse 6, it talks about the fact, and, and we'll, we'll just go there, against uh, second, or 1 Samuel 30, uh, verse 6, it says, Now David was greatly distressed. Do you think he would have been distressed? Absolutely. Uh, if you read this on your own, you'll find this story was probably much more uh, dramatic even than what I've tried to relate to you. It said he was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of the people was grieved. Every man for his sons and daughters. And here's a key here. It says, but, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Now, friend, I'm going to tell you that one of the key things that we have to understand when we go through tough situations, situations that where there's trials that are beyond what we think that we can handle, we have a choice. You may have heard the expression that uh, what doesn't kill you will make you stronger. Well, here's a great example of that. That's not a biblical expression, by the way, but it definitely fits with David's attitude here. David understood that in this time where nothing made sense, where everything, all the pressures were on him from people, uh, you know, from situations, he understood that if he was going to get through this, the only way he was going to get through this was getting close to God. Now, this idea of strengthening yourself in the Lord, I'm going to make it simple today and say this. If you find yourself in one of these situations, the key things that you can do, and there's a multitude of them, but they should all line up with this. Doing things to get closer to the Lord. Now, you know, practically, things like going to church, things like reading your Bible, things like prayer, you know, these are all things that... Um, that we can do, but there's there's other things that we can do as well. Just being mindful of God. You know, in the New Testament, Paul talks about the fact that he prayed unceasingly. Now, if you've heard me talk about this before, if you've got an idea of prayer being just, you know, being on your knees with your hands clasped and your eyes closed, well, I can tell you right now that even though that's a form of prayer, Paul definitely was not walking around on his knees with his eyes closed and his hands clasped all day. What that talks about is having a God consciousness. You know, and for us, you know, all through the day, I've tried to cultivate a lifestyle where I'm constantly aware of God's presence. You know, whether you know it or not, friend, God is with us all the time. He knows the thoughts and intents of our heart. There isn't any time during the day that God isn't available for us to talk to and relate to Him. But for us, it's, it's us that makes the decision to dialogue with Him. And so with everything we do, I, I guess I want to sum this up by saying, be somebody who diligently seeks the Lord. And again, some of the things that I practically mentioned, like church, prayer, reading the Bible. Again, there's many other things you can do. Fellowship, uh, communion. You know, there's a lot of different things. But I sum it up by saying this. If you are diligently seeking the Lord, it talks about this in, the, in, uh, in Hebrews 11, uh, 11, 6. 
the fact that, you know, God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So if we have the mindset that we want to get close to God, especially in a time of trial, and I'm going to tell you that in the time of trial, there's one of two directions that people go. You know, and I've, I've realized this myself. There's often a tendency that when things go wrong, when you feel like God hasn't met your expectations about something because he's left you in the middle of a trial, often what that can do is, and, and this is what the devil would have us do, is to draw away from God. And, you know, it's, it's uh, very clear when we look at Hebrews uh, 10, 39, for example, it says, but we are not those who draw back under perdition. Other, uh, other translation talk about it this way, uh, that word perdition, to draw back unto or turn away from God. That's what that's talking about. Uh, but we are not those who draw back unto perdition or to turn away from God, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Now, Again, if you listen to Daily Renewal at all, you'll know that I often talk about the restoration of the soul. And the soul being uh, made up of the mind, the will, and the emotions. Now, when we are tempted to draw back, what that is, is that's the enemy trying to put a thought. He's trying to affect our soul. He's trying to affect the way we think. He doesn't want our thinking to line up with God's word and God's ways. Uh, he's trying to, to will us to do something that, um, that would uh, be, be our will rather than what God's will would be. That, again, is opposite thinking to what God would have us do. He wants us uh, his, his will to be our will, not to just do things our own way. And our emotions. Uh, you know, and often we see this idea of uh, when, when the thought to draw back or to turn away from God... Often our emotions are involved with this. You know, what we think is important, what, you know, the things that drive us emotionally, often if they're not, uh, if we don't hand those things over to God and our emotions get, our, our own emotional uh, emotions get stirred, that we're upset with God, again, angry with maybe what God uh, is doing because we don't fully understand it. Our emotions can play a role in us turning back. And that's why we have to rise above this and not turn back. Understand that, um, that, that the Lord wants to help us uh, in seeing our soul uh, come in line with him and his word. He wants to see it restored so that we would be those that would have the mind of Christ, that would think like him, uh, that we would want to do things the way that he wants them done, and the things that are important to us. We wouldn't be caught up in our own personal emotions, but we would follow in line with what uh, with the way he would want us to think. So when we look at this idea, first of all, understand, we have to guard against the temptation to go back into our old ways or to you know, kind of forsake God, say, you know what, I tried this Jesus thing and it didn't work. No, friend, even though temporarily it might not look like things are working, I can tell you that if you get close to the Lord, if we do what David gave us as an example here, if we strengthen ourselves in the Lord, if we draw close to God, it gives opportunity for him to build our faith. And, uh, and you know, the Bible says on a couple of occasions that the just shall live by faith. Now think about that for a moment. The idea of living by faith. You wouldn't need to live by faith if there wasn't things coming against you that you had to trust God for. And so as you go through this current situation, understand that God has allowed this to happen. And as hard as it might be right now, this is all within the grand scheme of the Lord to try and help build your faith so that you can see that you can trust him, that God is going to bring you uh, to the place where you need to be. He, he'll bring you there. And I'm going to talk about a little bit more here at the end of this. But the second thing, the second principle that I really want to talk to you about today is something that I uh, put into practice often. And I saw the example of this uh, when Jesus was on the cross. And we see this, uh, it's talked about in the book of Hebrews, uh, chapter 12, and verse 2. And we see uh, the example of when Jesus was on the cross. And remember, you know, he was betrayed by his own people. Uh, he was hung there uh, to die. And, uh, you know, if it wasn't for him dying on the cross and being buried and, and, and rising again and ascending into heaven to the right hand, uh, to, to be seated at the right hand of the Father, if that hadn't happened, 
There was no way for God's prized possession, which is you and I, mankind, those who were created in God's image. There's nothing else that God created that was more important than mankind. But with mankind being separated, there needed to be a, uh, a, an antidote. There needed to be an answer to this separation, to bring it so there was no separation between God and man. And when Jesus went to the cross and, and went through that experience of a death, burial, and resurrection and ascension, what that did is that bridged the gap so that man once again could be reconciled, uh, reconciled to God. And, and so this was a big deal, what happened on the cross. Now, I, I say that to now quote this verse in uh, uh, Hebrews 2, uh, 12, chapter, or verse 2. It says this. It says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, the part, part that I really want to focus on here is that it, it, this picture that I want to relate to you is that when Jesus was on the cross, as excruciating as it was, and I don't think there'd be much of an argument for anybody that truly understands uh, with our limited understanding of what Jesus did on the cross. Physically, it was the, the most painful death you could have, but that doesn't even take into account the spiritual realm, the, the things that were coming against him spiritually as he hung on the cross. Uh, as this was going on, how did Jesus get through this? Because it does say that at one point, it talks about the fact that legions of angels, he could have called legions of, legions of angels to assist him, and, and he could have removed himself from the cross, but he didn't. As tough as it was, how did he get through it? Well, it says here that it was for the joy that was set before him that able, enabled him to endure the cross. Well, what was that joy? Now, we could say that that joy was that, uh, you know, he knew that he was going to be fulfilling the plan, that, you know, that he would soon be through this death experience, and, and he could see that, you know, he would be uh, seated at the right hand of the throne of God uh, from this point on, only in a few hours. Uh, it, it could be, you know, I also liken it to this, the joy that was set before him, and, and it was likened to what I just said. You know, he realized that what he was going through at this, at this current time I believe he was looking beyond this and understood. He could see that the, the, the answer to the world's problems ever since Adam had sinned in the garden, ever since that day where that separation had occurred in the garden, today was the day where it was going to be fulfilled, that that separation would be bridged and mankind would once again be able to, for those who call upon the name of the Lord, would now be saved, would now have that relationship rebuilt or reconnected with God. And so, you know, just the fact that he, he, he looked forward to that, that was enough for him to go, you know what, as much as this is painful right now, I can go through it because the pain I'm going through, as bad as it is, isn't anywhere uh, incomparable to what's going to come after this pain is done. As I mentioned, you know, when I look at God and how he looks at us, you know, we're, you know, we're wretched beasts. We're, we're, we're sinners. The Bible says that our sin is, or our righteousness is as filthy rags, as, as, as much of a washout as we were. You know, Jesus understood that when we were created, God had great plans for mankind. And to see his prized possession, mankind, come back to the point where they could have true relationship with him unbroken. This was God's, this was something that was so important to God. And, and so, you know, when I see Jesus on the cross is saying, you know, the joy that was set before him, I think that all of us can have a little bit of an understanding that he was looking to the future. And see, for us, as we go through our trials, I know that's one thing that I tend to look at. You know, I, as I look at, at uh, you know, I've got some friends that are going through some things right now and some of the co uh, counseling that I do, I say to this, often say to them, I say, friend, right now you may be going through this, but you give this a couple months, you give this a year, and you'll be looking back at this situation and it won't be nearly as painful. And you know, for all of us, you know, I, I often use this illustration as well. You know, when we've got a, an issue in our life, it's often hard to see anything else. 
You know, it's just like if the issue, if, if the hand represents my issue. You know, as I'm looking at my issue, you know, you, you know, anybody else can see anything beyond the hand. But for me, all I can see is the hand. You know, and that's the way our issues often are. But you have to understand that behind or on the other side of the hand, God has already planned, already prepared many things for us. And there will be a day where we'll be on the other side of this trial as long as we stay close to him. You know, so, so we have to learn this idea or this principle of looking beyond the trial, understanding that God has got great things for us. So I want to talk to you a little bit more about looking beyond the trial. First of all, friend, what we need to establish is that there is no weapon formed against us that will prosper. There isn't anything that God hasn't already seen that he can't find us a way around. Now, for us, it comes down to, do we really trust that that is the case? And uh, so, so with that, understanding, first of all, that there is nothing that will take God by surprise, it comes down to this. We have to understand that we have an enemy that wants to steal our hope. And if he can steal our hope, then he can steal our future. Now, when we look at, for example, a lot of people when they uh, commit suicide, why do people commit suicide? It's because they don't see any way out. They don't see any future. And, you know, that hope and future, the idea of hope and future go closely together. When people lose hope, they have no future. When they see they have no future, they lose hope. It's the same thing. All right, very close to the same. So we have to understand that uh, no matter what situation you're in, God, if you're still living and breathing, God still has a plan for you. And we see this uh, example in Jeremiah 29, 11. Uh, it says this, and, and I've heard many say, well, yeah, Pastor Lau, but in Jeremiah, he's talking to the Jewish people. Well, you know, at this time, he was... But we have to understand that when he says this, God's not a respecter of persons. And if this is his plan for the Jewish people, this is also the thoughts that he has for us. He says, for I know the thoughts in Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the thoughts I have towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. Now, the problem that we often have you might say, well, I know people that, that, that uh, were Christians that uh, died and it, it didn't seem like it went really well. It didn't seem like it ended well. Uh, even the apostles, if you do a, a history check on the apostles, a lot of them died a martyr's death. You know, it could be said, well, you know, people might say, well, how does that end? That scripture doesn't seem to apply for them. That didn't seem like they had a really good end. Well, you know, friend, what we have to understand is a lot of times we have our thoughts about what this life is or thoughts about all of this, and it's all contained in this life here and now. You know, many times when we are Christians, we may know people that, that pass on to be with the Lord and, you know, it's really hard. You know, they might be young and we look at this stuff and, and you have to remember that for us, you know, the ones who are left behind, you know, they grieve because they miss these people. But if you really do believe the Bible, we have to understand that there is an eternity beyond this. This is just a pit stop. In fact, the Bible says that this is not even our home. Our home is beyond here, that there is life beyond here in eternity. And so, you know, we, we understand that when somebody goes on to be with the Lord, this is a good thing. Uh, Paul said to live is Christ, but to die is gain. But again, that's often hard to grasp because, you know, we, you know, we've have this life here that we know about. We, we, we don't really understand what goes on. We not, we have a small amount of understanding. We understand to a point what goes on beyond here. But, you know, we have a, a life internally with the Lord that is a life without pain, a life without sin, a world without sin. It's a way better place than here. And so you know, we have to learn to embrace that. But, but understand this, that while we are here, this does apply. The idea of having a life that has, that where we can have peace. You know, he says uh, he has thoughts of peace for us and not of evil. In other words, God is not out to get you, friend. You know, I've heard people say, well, you know, what if God, you know, what if God isn't, uh, is out to get me? You know, you don't know the things I've done. <laughs> 
Here's the great part about it. As I mentioned earlier, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There isn't one of us that can stand before a righteous, holy God without believing in the, and, and uh, you know, trusting in the sacrifice that Jesus made, without, without making that commitment to Jesus. There isn't one of us that stands before God uh, in our own righteousness. We can't. We've all failed. And we're all, uh, we're, we're all doomed to a, a life separate from God if we, you know, that's the destination we're going to, uh, if we don't f- decide to follow Jesus the way the Bible shows us to do that. So we can't stand before God. So this idea, uh, and we can stand before him when we make that commitment. Uh, so this idea of, are you good enough? Well, we'll never be good enough. We'll always continue, you know, you know as much as, um, God begins to flush out a lot of these things in our life and, and you know, we're molded and shaped in the image of Christ. What that means is we, as we uh, walk with Jesus, we become more like him. You know, we're still, still going to sin. We're still going to feel the effects of sin. And we have to understand that as long as we biblically make a commitment to Christ, you know, there isn't anything that you're going to do that's bad enough for him to, to reject you. And the Bible says in... Uh, Deuteronomy 31 6 that he will never leave you nor forsake you you know it just you know when we look at our our relatives in um, in real life you know some of them might say that they forsake you but really you can't uh, do any kind of blood transfusion to change your relatives if you were born into a family there's nothing you can do to separate you uh, from that family as far as through blood you know, again, you can make a decision to walk away and say, I'm not related to them, but the bottom line is, you are! And it's the same with Jesus. Only it's better because he commits not only to naturally, he's never going to leave you nor forsake you, but you have to understand that blood relation that you have with relatives, the blood that, that Jesus shed on the cross of Calvary has that same effect. You are now, now part of the family. It's not like he like he's just going to say, oh, I'm going to walk away from you. No, by his blood, now you are part of the family of God. And Jesus... Uh, you know, that blood covenant that is made uh, with Jesus cannot be broken. And, and, you know, he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You are family to him. Uh, so that's really important. You know, the, now the next question, you, you know, if you're saying, well, okay, Pastor Lyle, I guess that, you know, I guess I understand that God's not going to leave me no matter how bad I've blown it. You know, may, maybe I get it that God's not going to leave me, but I'm not sure if I can make it. I'm not sure if I've got the strength to make it. This trial is too tough. You know, friend, I've found often, you know, as I progress in my Christian walk, there's a lot of the trials that I, I've gone through, say, uh, maybe in the past two years, that if God would have brought those on me six, ten years ago, maybe I wouldn't have made it. The fact that you're going through this trial, again, God knows what you're going through and you just have to get close to him and he will find a way to guide you through. Even when you don't think you have the strength. We see in uh, in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, there's an example where Paul was going through this and he actually asked the Lord three times to remove uh, this, this, uh, what was called, re, uh, uh, termed as this thorn in the flesh, this trial that, that Paul was going through, Paul said, hey, can you remove this from me? And Jesus said, you know, I'm not going to remove this from you. Uh, he basically says this, my grace is sufficient and my strength is made perfect in weakness. I, I encourage you to read this, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. There's, there's the two components there is this. My grace is sufficient. I often talk about grace. And grace isn't something you can earn. Uh, but grace is often looked at, first of all, as God God's unmerited favor. You can do nothing to get it. But it is the favor of God that is upon you when you make a decision to trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Now, it, uh, that's one part of it, but the second part of it, you know, what is grace? So, so it's this unmerited favor, but it's more than that. Grace is also, I look at it this way, it's the power of God that enables you to do what you can't do in your own strength. 
And see, for us, for many years, in all different situations, we've come to rely upon our own strength. And it's when, when we cannot do things in our own strength, that's often when we falter. Friend, what God is trying to do possibly in your life is he's trying to get you to the point where you quit relying on yourself and you rely upon his grace. He knows the situations you're in, and as tough as they are, he says, my grace is sufficient. The power of God is, uh, is sufficient for you to enable you to do whatever you need to have done, whatever needs to be done in your life. The power of God is there to help you through, uh, and, and you can't rely on your own strength. The power of God goes beyond what you can do in your own strength. And in fact, the quicker you get through trying to do it on your own, the better. So, he says his grace is sufficient, but he also qualifies this by saying that his strength is made perfect in weakness. And again, friend, this has everything to do with realizing, you know, there's times where you just have to give up and give it to God. A lot of these circumstances, you know, we've, you may have sleepless nights. You may, uh, you'll wonder how you can do this, wonder how you can do that, and who you can talk to for this. Friend, for a lot of these situations, it could be that God is just trying to get you to the place where you say, hey, you know, the just walk by faith, and I'm trying to help you to walk by faith in me. Trust me. If I say you want, say I'm going to get you through this, I will get you through this, no matter what the enemy puts up against you. You know, in Romans 8, 31, it says, if God is for us, who can be against us? No matter what comes against you, friend, God already knows about it. He already knows how to get you through it. The tough part for you, your responsibility is to get close to him and trust that he will bring you through the way that you are supposed to get through. It doesn't mean it's going to work out exactly how you want it, well, I want to get through it, but you'll find, as, as I rejoiced about this week in my own life, looking back, past couple years, some tough situations, but as I look back this week, I realized that in a lot of the major things that we had been praying about for quite a few years in my life, I'm at the point where God has delivered me through those things, and I'm rejoicing now because these are some of the principles that I put into practice. And I know that if you put some of these things into practice, they will work for you the same way that they worked for me. Well, I hope you got something out of that today. If you did, uh, I want to uh, ask you to consider becoming a subscriber to our channel so you'll know when all of our latest videos are up. Also, uh, share and like this video with anybody that you think that it will help. Also, if you uh, desire to help our ministry financially, please see the links below. Well, I really enjoyed our session of Daily Renewal today, but until next time, God bless you and have a great day.